Good morning to all of you, and thanks for joining us for our webinar this morning. I'm Trish Scorpio, and I work with the Integrated Communications Team at Midwest Dairy. And as a quick reminder for all of you, Midwest Dairy represents 8,000 dairy farm families to 38 million consumers across 10 Midwestern states. And we work on behalf of dairy farmers to increase dairy sales, foster innovation, and inspire consumer confidence in both dairy products and on-farm practices. This webinar today is the third of a quarterly, a quarterly series that we've been hosting this year on a variety of consumer confidence related topics for both our staff and for all of our partners. And we're really pleased to be sharing information this morning on the topic of dairy's role in a sustainable food system. To kick off this session, I'd love to introduce you to our speaker. We're really lucky this morning to have Dr. Greg Miller with us. He's the Chief Science Officer and Executive Vice President of Research, Regulatory, and Scientific Affairs for National Dairy Council and Dairy Management, Inc. And in addition, he's an adjunct associate professor in the Department of Food Science and Nutrition at the University of Illinois. He's a member of the editorial boards of a number of key nutrition publications that some of you are familiar with, including the Journal of the American College of Nutrition, the Journal of Nutritional Biochemistry, Current Nutrition and Food Science, and Mature Medicine Canada. And he's also an editorial advisor for Dairy Foods Magazine, which, which is a publication that many of us in the industry are very familiar with. So I'm really pleased he's able to join us today to share his perspective on this topic of the role of dairy in a sustainable food system. Before we move into the presentation, I thought I'd let you know we're going to take a couple of breaks throughout the presentation because we want to make sure that we allow time for your questions. And after Dr. Miller finishes his remarks, uh, I'm going to share some ideas with you about how you can continue to uh, hold the sustainable nutrition conversation with uh, a lot of your key audiences. And I'm going to share some resources provided by both Midwest Dairy and the National Dairy Council. So now I'll turn it over to Dr. Miller. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, being on board and participating. I, uh, I hope that you will um, get some key learnings about dairy and the role of dairy in a sustainable food system uh, as we finish the presentation, and I look forward to your questions. Um, <clears throat> the first slide here is really a definition of sustainable diets, and this is out of a report that came out of the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. And I know you're typically not supposed to read but um, for this one particular slide, I'm going to um, go ahead and break some of the rules here and, and do that because I think this is a really uh, important definition. I think it's a, a pretty uh, full and encompassing definition as we think about what are sustainable diets. And in the FAO definition, they indicate that sustainable diets are those diets with low environmental impacts which contribute to food and nutrition security and to healthy life for present and future generations. Sustainable diets are protective and respectful of biodiversity and ecosystems, culturally acceptable, accessible, economically fair and affordable, nutritionally adequate, safe and healthy, while optimizing natural and human resources. So that's a lot to kind of take in all at once, but I think it's an um, a all-encompassing definition. And the, the, the really a key takeaway point here for me is that, that it's complicated. There are a lot of things that go into talking about what is a sustainable diet and it comes from a sustainable food system. It's, there are a lot of moving parts and pieces that have to be considered when we talk about sustainable diets. So this is really a key slide for you to kind of remember and think about in terms of all the things that belong in, in talking about sustainable diets in terms of accessibility, affordability, the economic and social aspects of, of, of eating and eating a, a healthy diet. Next slide. In the next slide, we kind of really um, take what is very complex and try to make it much more simple. And, and when we think about sustainability, uh, particularly from a uh, uh, an industry perspective, it, there are three key pillars that we look at, and that is the environmental, the economic, and the social issues. And we think that dairy can be a really vital part of what we think is a, a healthy and sustainable diet. Um, it, it really hits the nexus of there. And we'll talk about um, different things in this presentation around 
um, how dairy fits and addresses some of the environmental, economic, and social issues and the important role that dairy plays in um, enhancing those areas. It's important for us to understand that as we make choices that are either economic or environmental, they may have unintended consequences in one of the other two pillars of uh, what are a sustainable diet. And so we think about it in, in that context. Um, next slide, please. Next, there we go. So uh, from a, a, a dairy point of view, when we think about sustainable diets and sustainable food systems, we think of it about providing consumers um, you know, nutrient-rich dairy foods that they really like and want in a way that's good for the industry, for people, and the earth. Um, it's both looking at it economically, environmentally, and socially better now in, in terms of how we produce and, and deliver and consume dairy foods. Uh, and for future generations as well too. So, um, you know, we're 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 talking about sustainability and, and eating sustainably and in the sustainable food system. But but why is this such an important discussion? Well, the next slide um, really helps us begin to get at the crux of that. Um, we have a growing population, and it's predicted that by 2050 there'll be anywhere between 9.5 and 10 billion people on this planet. So that's a lot of people to feed. Um, there, there are a lot of people now who are taking up this mantle and concerned about this. So there's a lot of pressure on the food industry, not only the dairy industry, but the food industry in general, um, from non-governmental organizations, uh, from governmental organizations who are trying to put policies in place to ensure that we have um, a sustainable food um, supply. Um, competitors, because competitors are trying to position themselves as more sustainable um, from consumers, because consumers are beginning to talk about, not only do I want to consume foods that are good for me, I want to consume foods that are good for the planet. And so it's, it's, it's this growing population, you know, the climate change issues that are out there, um, creating a lot of pressure for the food industry and the dairy industry in terms of doing a better job of producing sustainable foods that are that are good for us um, to produce the kind of um, food we're going to need over the next um, decade or so um, means that we're going to have to increase food production by about 70 percent, and we're going to have to do that with less resources. So that's the challenge that the food industry and the dairy industry are faced with when we begin to talk about sustainable food system and sustainable diets. And, and in the next slide we're looking at not only do we need more food and more calories for this growing population, but we need more of the right kinds of foods, more nutrient-rich foods, because we have issues that are going on out there. Not only do we have a large number of folks across the globe who are malnourished or food insecure or have micronutrient deficiencies, we also have a global obesity epidemic. So we have a situation where people are have um, too many calories, but are not getting adequate amounts of nutrition. So it's not only about creating more food and more calories, but more of the right kinds of foods that are nutrient rich, um, so that we are replacing nutrient poor foods in our diet with nutrient rich diets, getting adequate calories in our diets, um, but not too many calories in our diets. That's that's the kind of future that we're looking at. You know. During the Green Revolution, we became really good at producing a lot more food. Now the concern is, is that um, are we producing enough of the right kinds of foods? Do we have enough diet diversity? Because we're getting most of our calories from what they would consider as monocrops, corn, wheat, rice, um, and, and the need for more diversity in our diets. When we think about the increasing need for food and calories, we certainly see dairy foods as nutrient-rich sources of foods, and that's going to pray, place pressure on dairy. So we, as we look at the next slide, we see the projected demand for dairy in this global food system is going to increase dramatically. And the, the global demand for dairy um, is going to be projected to be around 2 trillion tons of fresh milk equivalents. That, that's at current productivity levels. Um, what that would mean is that we would need another 83 million additional cows on the planet. Um, that's not going to happen. 
um, we don't have the room for all that. So what that means is that we are going to need to be able to produce more milk uh, without many more additional cows. Um, that means we're going to need innovation. Um, innovation in technology, innovation in, in farm animal practices, innovation in, in genetics and breeding to order for um, the dairy industry to be able to really meet those demands that are going to come in the future for, for dairy foods. But, you know, the dairy farmers have been doing a good job, and as we will see in the next slide, over the past 70 years, dairy farmers have really done a great job in terms of becoming much more efficient in their production of milk. So as we look from 1944 to 2007, we see the productivity gains that have been accrued in the U.S. Uh, in terms of milk production. And if you look at the dark line in this chart, um, what you see is over time the number of cows that we have had in the U.S. has dramatically declined. And it, if you look at the green line, what you see is over time the production and the efficiency that we've gotten from individual cows has increased dramatically. So farmers in the U.S. have become very um, much more productive in terms of their milk production over time, dramatically. And you may say, well, well, how have they been able to do that? Um, they've been able to do that through um, genetics. They've been able to do that primarily through a lot of animal care practices. Um, they really treat their animals really, really well. Um, good housing environments, good feed, um, really good nutrition. Um, they have almost every farmer has a nutritionist that works for them to ensure that these cows are fed um, really, really well because that, again, helps increase productivity. So animal care practices, genetics, and feeding have really been primary drivers in the productivity gains that we've seen over the last 70 years. And as, as, as a result of that, as we see in the next slide, um, you know, farmers have been able to um, produce a gallon of milk now using 90% less land, 65% less water, while producing 75% less manure and having a 63% smaller carbon footprint. So farmers are, you know, the world's ecologists, they've been working very hard to be efficient, um, use less resources, um, and it becomes a win-win situation. Um, it's better for them because they save money and become more profitable. Um, it's good for the environment because they're using less resources and producing less byproducts. On the next slide, we start talking about some other issues in terms of there are folks out there who would say, oh, we're, we're better off if we just got rid of cows because um, they produce byproducts and um, it's intensive farming. But the reality is, is um, you know, they are pretty efficient. Um, the, the, the quote I have here is from a report that came out of the Netherlands, the, the Health Council of the Netherlands, and they, they said that the production of meat and dairy forms the biggest food-related burden, um, and it's because of the inefficient production. Um, a production of a kilo of meat protein requires six kilos of vegetable protein. While, while technically that's accurate, what we see in the next slide is that there's a little bit more to it than, than just that. Um, the reality is, is that what we are feeding cows in the U.S. and across the globe is, is not human consumable. Most of what we feed in, in the U.S. is anywhere between 75 to 80 percent of the cow's diet is something that couldn't be consumed by humans. What's really, really cool is that cows are great recyclers. They can recycle food that people can't eat. Now, I, I, if I were doing this lecture in, a, in a, a room where we have a bunch of people, I'd ask you to say, how many of you like, like almonds and ask you to raise your hands? And generally, uh, more than 90% of the people in the room raise their hands. They, they like almonds. And I'll say, how many of you like citrus and you like oranges? And again, majority of people will raise their hands. But the, the thing that I'll ask next is that, well, how many of you will eat the almond shell? and almost nobody raises their hand. And the same when, when we talk about the citrus peel from the orange that you consume. Those are things that, that we don't consume. But we can feed those to, to cows and they can recycle them. 
So we feed them things like citrus pulp and almond shells and cottonseed and spent brewer's grains. Um, and they recycle those and turn it into human consumable, nutrient-rich milk and meat. Um, if we didn't have those animals there to recycle those byproducts from human consumption, then um, we would have to put those in landfills and find other ways to dispose and get rid of them. So there's a real useful value of cows in the food system in terms of converting what our, our waste products for, for us as humans into what are our human consumable things. And we look at the return on the investment the average human edible feed conversion rate, so the part that we feed that humans actually probably could have consumed, what we find is for energy that you get a 1.1 conversion rate, for protein it's 2.1. So the return on investment on the human edible fraction for energy is 107 percent, and for protein it's 208 percent. So you're really getting some really good returns for that investment. And if you were trading in the stock market and you could get 208%, believe me, you'd really be going after that. So, so we feed these cows these non-human consumable pieces and they recycle them and turn them into nutrient-rich foods that we consume. And for dairy, if you look at the next slide, what you see is, is that dairy is um, very nutrient-rich. Um, the problem that we have is that in the U.S., we're not consuming the full amount that we're being recommended to consume through the dietary guidelines for Americans. And they're recommending three servings a day, but on average, we're only consuming about 1.85 servings. Um, but still, um, very important because they're delivering large amounts of those nutrients of concern. And, and those nutrients of concern um, in the dietary guidelines are those ones that in the U.S. we're not consuming enough of, and um, in fact, we're not consuming it to the point where we're worried about the underconsumption to the point where it can create health problems in the U.S. population. The next slide um, really shows you the nutrient value that, that dairy can bring to a diet. Um, now, this chart right here I really like because it, uh, if you look along the bottom here, it's all the various different nutrients that we get in our diet from consuming dairy. And, and this chart really just reflects current consumption. Um, it would be even greater nutrient value to our diet if we were consuming what was actually being recommended. But at current consumption rates, we're only getting 10% of our calories um, from dairy products. But look at the nutrient return you get from that calorie cost, if you will. Um, we're getting vitamin D, calcium, phosphorus, vitamin A, B12, um, riboflavin, high quality protein, zinc, potassium. Um, you know, we talk about milk and, and dairy being a great source of nine essential nutrients. Um, you know, we're limited to nine because of um, regulatory issues around what FDA says you can say. But, but dairy is a really important contributor of, of many other nutrients as well, too. In fact, we don't talk about dairy as a great source of zinc, but in fact, um, dairy is, is one of the top three sources of zinc in our diet. Um, it's, and so it's, it's an important source. And so um, we would be getting even more nutrition where we're consuming what's actually um, being recommended. So, so on, a, on a calorie cost basis, we get a big powerful punch in nutrition from, from dairy consumption. And if you look at the next slide, it really just re-emphasizes that in terms of helping you understand to replace the essential nutrients that you get from just the three servings of, of milk that you might consume, you would have to consume a lot of other food. So in terms of, of protein, you know, you'd have to consume four eggs to get the same amount that you would from three glasses of milk. If you're looking at calcium, you know, you're going to have to eat a lot of kale. You're going to have to eat a lot of broccoli. I mean, there's folks who say, oh, you don't need dairy for calcium in your diet. You can just get it from other foods. Well, um, that's true, but you're going to have to consume a lot of those other foods. So, um, again, there'll be a calorie cost. You'll have to consume more calories. Not sure if that's really a good suggestion in light of the obesity epidemic that's occurring across the globe. Um, you're going to have, it's going to cost you more um, in terms of actual dollars out of your pocket. 
um, there's a volume cost in terms of having to eat a lot more food and you know I'm not sure what the environmental cost is because we're just now beginning to start to do some of the science and the calculations around well what is the environmental cost to consuming this much more broccoli or this much more kale to get the actual calcium that you would need in your diet. Uh, I'm not going to read through every nutrient there. You can you can see it on the chart, but um, there is a calorie volume and dollar cost to getting those nutrients from alternative sources. And if you look at the next slide, um, not only um, are you going to have to consume a lot of other different foods to get the calcium that you might need in your diet and the other nutrients that the dairy delivers. What I'm really trying to show you here is that you know these dairy substitutes that are often put out there as ways to get calcium are not broadly consumed by the American public. I mean milk represents 50 percent of the typical dietary calcium intake but, but fortified juices only represent 3 percent other fortified um, non-dairy beverages, those substitutes like soy, um, cashew, and others, if they are even fortified, they still represent less than 1% of what people are consuming today. Fish and shellfish, broccoli and spinach and greens, again, they really um, represent a small percentage of what people are, are getting calcium from in terms of the typical diet today. Now, the real takeaway point from this slide is that if you want people to move away from dairy to alternative calcium sources, what you really are asking people to do is make dramatic changes in their diet. Not sure if um, it's something that people are going to easily be able to do, and it means big, large shifts in current diets to get to these new, new types of diets. And if you look at the next slide, um, this is um, information that, that um, came out of the uh, Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee report for the 2010 Dietary Guidelines. So I work for the dairy industry and so I'm going to tell you alternative sources of uh, calcium are probably not as good as dairy and you would expect that from me. But this is from the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee report which is our the best and brightest scientists in the U.S. who get appointed to this committee. And they're the ones who said that you know, recommended dairy substitutes aren't aren't really practical um, because um, the amount uh, the amount of many of these potential alternatives to provide the amount of calcium that you would need are going to again be too many calories, going to be too large an amount to consume on a daily basis. They're concerned about bioavailability. That means is the calcium in these alternatives really absorbable? Um, for some sources, they're not as absorbable as dairy. Um, and there's concerns about, for example, research that's been published around soy beverage that over time that calcium can precipitate out and form a sludge on the, on the bottom and so that calcium may not be as bioavailable. There have been absorption studies that show that it's about 25 percent less well absorbed as calcium from, from cow's milk. Um, and so there are some vegetables where the calcium is even more readily absorbed than it is from milk or, or dairy products. However, the problem there is that the calcium load from those sources are usually very small. So um, this is the, the, the Dietary Guidelines Committee um, and what they've said about it. So um, they're, they're kind of in line with, with some of the messages that we're, we're delivering. On the next slide, you know, we talk about we talk about um, environment, we talk about social issues, and we talk about economic issues as a part of the, the, the triple bottom line in looking at sustainability. And when we look at dairy products, what we find is that from an economical point of view, you know, it's a very affordable source of great nutrition at only about you know, 26 cents a serving. And so a um, very affordable source of, of nutrition um, from, from dairy products. Um, if we go to the next slide, you know, um, when we talk about sustainability and sustainable eating, you know, one of the key issues that I think as we think about sustainable food systems, and, and I like to talk about is the food waste issue. Um, the average American family of four, um, their wastage is about 1,606 pounds of uneaten food annually. You know, they, about a third of the food that, that's purchased in the U.S. gets wasted. So it's like telling a family 
when you go out to go grocery shopping and you pick up four bags of grocery, once you leave the store, just take one of them and just go ahead and drop it right in the garbage because eventually that's what happens. Um, um, it, it's, it, that's a problem and it, there's a huge cost to it. If, as we see in the next slide, um, that one third of food that is wasted um, has a lot of value. The lost retail value is $166 billion. Um, the disposal cost is about $1 billion in local taxpayer cost. Because where does that food going? A lot of it's ending, ending up in landfills. And so that exa exacerbates the problem that we've already got. You've already had environmental costs to produce that food. When you put it into a landfill, eventually as it degrades, it creates more methane and more greenhouse gases. Um, if, if food wasted across the globe were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases. And so that's a problem. And so that to me is one of the low-hanging fruit, if you will, in terms of things that we can do as people to reduce our footprint is, you know, buy food that you're going to eat, you know, um, you know, don't overconsume calories, um, and, you know, recycle as well, too, um, or, or do other things to try to minimize the amount of food waste that's coming out of, out of various homes. So uh, another pillar in um, the, the dietary guidelines are social issues, and one of those relates then to non-communicable diseases. And again, um, this is out of a, another report that came out of the, the United Nations looking at efforts to try to reduce rates of non-communicable diseases because they are responsible for three out of five deaths worldwide. Many of them are preventable. The, the health care costs to governments are enormous. Um, you know, um, we talk about cardiovascular disease, we talk about um, type 2 diabetes. I mean, uh, a couple of years ago, the, the Center for Disease Prevention and Control in the U.S. sounded the alarm bells that um, the, the rising rates of type 2 diabetes in the U.S. could break the health care bank. Um, the enormous costs associated with type 2 diabetes are huge. And, and it's, it's happening all over the globe not only in developed countries, but in um, developing countries as well, too. So the UN has is, is set out goals to try to reduce the rates of non-communicable diseases. Um, they would like to see a 25% decrease um, by 2025. And, and, of course, a lot of this is being driven, driven by lifestyle, and that's why they're focused here. And, of course, as we talk about lifestyle, it's about smoking, exercise, alcohol consumption, but in particularly diets and making sure that we have nutrient-rich diets with um, adequate calories but not overconsumption of calories. So if, if we go to the next slide and we begin to talk about healthy diets and healthy dietary patterns, of course the dietary guidelines has you know, laid out dietary patterns that they think um, would be considered healthy dietary patterns. Of course, the DASH diet is one of those dietary patterns, the healthy U.S. dietary pattern, and then the Mediterranean dietary pattern as well, too. So there are different dietary patterns that can be associated with good health. Um, but, you know, what, what I'm trying to point out here in this slide is that from both the 20, um, 50, 2010 dietary guidelines, they um, came out and said modern evidence Modern evidence shows that the intake of milk and milk products is linked to improved bone health, especially to children and adolescents. And one of the questions I always get is, well, what does moderate evidence mean? And how strong is that? Well, um, that was probably one of the higher levels of, of evidence that they had when they wrote the dietary guidelines. There weren't many, if anything, that really hit a much higher level of evidence in terms of science to support the recommendation that's being made. And they, in, in the 2015 dietary guidelines, which was the subsequent one, they reiterated and reinforced what was, um, what was said in the dietary guidelines from um, 2010 in that um, the intake of milk and milk products is associated with not only improved bone health, um, but it's also associated with a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and with lower blood pressure. The only additional add in the 2015 dietary guidelines was um, they're talking about the relationship between dairy intake and um, reduced weight. 
So if we go to the next slide, um, we talk about, okay, you know, the dietary guidelines points out the role and the value of dairy foods in reducing our risk of certain chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and osteoporosis. In 2004, we supported analysis that was done by um, um, Dr. David McCarran and Dr. Robert Haney. Many of you may have, have heard of, of, of these guys. They're pretty well known in the field. But they went back and looked at, um, you know, if we could move people from uh, um, those people who are low consumers of dairy, one or less servings a day, to being good consumers, up to three to four servings per day, what would be the impact on, on health care costs knowing that we could uh, reduce risk of, of these chronic diseases? And doing that analysis, what they found was is that there was the potential for over $200 billion in health care cost savings over a five-year period by just getting people to consume adequate amounts of dairy as a part of a, a healthy diet. Huge, huge, tremendous savings. And, and quite frankly, this, this data is a little bit old. Uh, I've seen some newer numbers. And we're talking trillions of dollars that could be saved by moving people up to adequate um, dairy intake. Australia um, um, saw our study and did a similar type of study with their own data from their own country and found um, a similar type of, uh, of value. Of course, their, their calculation was done a little bit differently than ours. They looked at the cost, the health care cost attributable um, to low dairy product consumption. So you assume that if you got people up to adequate consumption, this would be the health care savings that you would accrue. And what they found was just over one year, it was close to $2 billion. And, and that's similar to, to the result that we saw in our analysis as well, too. So two different studies, um, both reinforcing that um, consuming adequate dairy as a part of a healthy diet can um, significantly reduce those health care costs that were talked about in the dietary guidelines. But, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of people now who are, um, if we go to the next slide, you see, beginning to talk about sustainable diets and sustainable eating. And, um, you know, although the data is still very new and very young, um, that's not stopping people from getting out and telling people how to eat. Um, we see in the Scientific American article here, sustainable eating, the low carbon diet. Um, tips for green and sustainable diets, and um, even Oprah Winfrey is getting into it in, in her old magazine. She's talking about six steps to sustainable eating. The problem that I, I have is that, you know, um, we've got to be careful that we don't get ahead of the science in terms of dietary guidelines and, and recommendations around what is sustainable eating. Many of you probably heard the brouhaha that occurred when the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee wanted to put sustainable sustainability into the dietary guidelines for Americans, but in the end um, they weren't um, because it was considered outside the scope of the committee. Um, my concern is that they can't see the forest because they're looking at a tree, and the tree is greenhouse gas. You know, they're, they're talking, we're talking about sustainable diets only in the context of lowering greenhouse gases, but the problem that we have is that, you know, within the food system there's social, economic, um, and um, in environmental issues, uh, and and we're only looking at one one environmental issue, and, and um, we make decisions based on that. Um, there could be unintended consequences in other part of the food system as a result of that. I kind of feel we are where we were with fat 50 years ago. Um, people were really concerned 50 years ago because heart disease rates were going up. Um, some people felt we needed to tell the people. Um, uh, give them dietary guidelines and recommendations to make policy decisions, even though we had limited science. The science wasn't very good, but they felt like, hey, we had to make decisions and move forward because of these increasing rates of heart disease. Uh, unfortunately, 50 years later, we're looking back and going, yeah, well, um, you know, diets that are high in fat can be healthy diets and healthy for, for the heart as well, too. So um, now we've got to change our, our point of view and position, which they did in the recent dietary guidelines. And so my concern is um, getting ahead of the science. And, and if you look at the next slide, um, you know, I, I, I actually article, it's probably, well, probably almost two years old now, but um, I still continue to follow the literature. And, and what we find is that, you know, as we look at the scientific literature around linking 
sustainable diets to um, dietary recommendations. And um, there's, there's not enough studies that have been done. A lot of them focus on the carbon footprint, um, and very few of them focus on land availability, water, biodiversity, other ecosystem measures. And, and the studies that are available are often inconsistent. They, they take different approaches, um, have different methodologies and different data sources. And so it's really hard to make really strong recommendations and conclusions about what is the best way to eat healthy and sustainably. Um, and my concern is that you know some of these studies are getting published in really good journals, but they're 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 inadequate. Um, one study, for example, um, looked at um, carbon, and um, they were looking from farm to consumer consumption and trying to relate dietary recommendations, either the current diet, what is the, what is the greenhouse gas footprint of a current diet, what would that footprint change like if we got them to eat according to the dietary guidelines, and you know, what if we even moved them in, in, a, in, a, in a different direction. And, and the problem was is that they didn't have carbon data from the farm to the consumer, so they imputed the data. Well, think about that. What does imputed mean? means they guessed. It was a good guess, but nonetheless, it was still a guess, um, and that's kind of the base of science that we're, we're working off right now. And so we need to do better and improve the methodologies. We're just now beginning to understand what to measure, how to measure it, what does it tell us, and then how do we apply that as we make dietary recommendations. For example, if you redid that calculation of here's the current diet in terms of what people are eating in the U.S. versus what the dietary guidelines recommend, would you do it on carbon per calories or carbon per 100 grams of food or carbon per serving size? Um, because each time you do that calculation, you get a different answer based on whatever metric you use to measure. If you do it per calories, then, then you know what comes out really good? And, and, and affordability is sugar. So sugar is really good. Uh, it's not bad for the environment. It's very affordable. It gives you calories. And so if you're doing it on a on affordability and per calorie basis, then sugar would come up as uh, a food that's really good in terms of a sustainable um, recommendation. And so I think we've got to be careful and cautious as we begin to look at how to make recommendations around diet and diet intake based on the limited data that we have available right now uh, until we better understand what metrics are the right metrics, what are the best ways to measure them, and then what are the best ways to apply them as we make dietary recommendations. And so as we look at the next slide, um, I, I'm beginning to try to pull it all together in terms of thinking about it because we have to ask ourselves again, you know, as we begin to look at all the dimensions of a sustainable food system and what that means in terms of eating a nutrient-rich, high-quality, healthy, and sustainable diet, you know, what are the key endpoints that we need to measure? How do we measure them credibly? How do we weight them? Do we worry more about greenhouse gas? Or we do, do we worry more about water? Or do we worry more about affordability? Um, what are the right measures? Who makes those decisions on what are the right trade-offs? Who, who's going to decide? Um, who's going to make those decisions? Because those are difficult decisions because um, we may be able to do things that improve um, the air and, and the water. But all of a sudden, accessibility becomes a problem. Or maybe affordability becomes a problem. And so those people who are in the lower socioeconomic status um, might not have accessibility to some of those nutrient-rich foods um, because now they're out of their out of their price range. So we've got to be very cautious and careful as we move forward to make decisions around what is an affordable and healthy diet. And in the next slide, um, we we look at from a report that was done by the National. Sciences it took them two years to develop this report. It's a really thorough and, and really well done report um, looking at what is a framework for assessing the effects of a food system on environment, health, and other outcomes. And um, one of the key conclusions they have is to derive at a decision whose benefit outweigh its risk because 
Um, there are unintended consequences of making decisions. Um, decision makers must carefully consider a broad range of effects and in interactions across the health, environmental, social, and economic domains because making a decision in one will potentially have unintended consequences in other parts of the food system. And so we've got to be careful there. And, and in the next slide, um, I, I guess I may, may be showing my age here. I don't know how many of you remember uh, BC Comics, but um, it was a comic that, that was around for quite a while. It says, friends, I have a truth concerning truth. And they say, well, what's that? The truth in our land has been replaced by consensus. What's that? It's like popular opinion. Well, I say you're wrong. And so do I. Me too. It's three against one. We win. What poll did you get that from anyway? And the little guy there who's got a peg leg says, even if you haven't got a leg to stand on, you can still be right. And uh, while this is kind of a cute little joke, um, there's a little bit of a serious side to it. And that is that, you know, with the, the growth of the Internet um, out there and, um, you know, public opinion has often started to take over. Um, we see that often in gluten-free. And, and you've all, probably all seen one of the um, late night shows where they go out on the street and they talk to people and they say, hey, are, are, you, uh, are you avoiding gluten? Oh, yeah, 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 I'm avoiding gluten. Well, what is gluten? Uh, well, I don't, I don't really know, but I heard a lot about gluten, so now I'm, I'm going gluten free and it's supposed to be healthy for me. So a lot of things are happening out there in, based on, on public opinion, but not, not often based on really good science. And so there's a, a note of caution that I'm trying to put out there in terms of um, when we talk about what is a healthy and sustainable diet, um, we, we need more data to really fully vet that out. And, and in the next slide, um, I'm trying to build a tale of caution. You can go ahead and do the build. Um, you know, what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, uh, we've got it wrong, gotten it wrong in the past, so we've got to be careful uh, and a little more cautious here. Consumers are already leery and, and concerned about the fact that uh, you know, the, the nutrition study of the day becomes the headline. You know, coffee's bad today. You know, and what we heard today, coffee now doesn't cause cancer. It's only a problem if you consume it way too hot. Um, so it's off the carcinogen list. And, you know, and we had the same issue with, with cholesterol for so many years. Eggs were on the naughty list, and cholesterol was on the naughty nutrient list. And then, you know, many years later, uh oh, guess what? Cholesterol is okay, and you can have your eggs. It's good. But, but the the news is is that it wasn't even until you know 16 years after the science was already in that we knew dietary cholesterol really wasn't a very important factor related to blood cholesterol levels that it finally came off the naughty nutrient list. It wasn't until the 2015 dietary guidelines when they said, you know. Cholesterol isn't a nutrient to avoid anymore. You know, we've got a big debate going on right now around saturated fat. We've already let go of total fat. Total fat is really not considered an issue when we talk about healthy diets. We're debating it right now around saturated fat. There's been at least four large meta-analysis that have said that, that saturated fat intake is not related to cardi cardiovascular disease and mortality. And so um, that's being debated. But um, we've got to be very careful about um, telling people what is a sustainable diet because I think we need a lot more data. And so if you look at the, at the next slide, you know, this is how we think about, um, you know, informing consumers. We need a lot of good science. We're still, um, we're still in the process of standardizing methodologies and approaches to what to measure, how to measure it. Um, and then how do we interpret that and then apply it in a way um, that makes really good sense in terms of what we tell consumers about a, a healthy and sustainable diet. There's lots and lots of research going on right now. Um, we need to build that science base, um, make it stronger, um, smarter, and then, um, then we can begin to give good dietary advice on what is really a, a healthy and sustainable diet. We have a ways to go. Um, we're working on it with others. Um, we're certainly working on it for the dairy industry and investing in nutrition research, sustainability research, product development research, because that, that can be a part of the solution to being more sustainable. Um, and as that data comes out, we'll be glad to share that with you and help you understand um, the role that the dairy industry is trying to play in um, reducing its 
uh, environmental footprint, trying to produce um, healthy, nutrient-rich foods that are affordable for our population. Um, uh, and with that, um, that's the um, um, my presentation. And I uh, I hope it was uh, helpful and, and informative. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Miller, for all that great information and talking us through the complexity of the sustainable nutrition discussion and, and really that importance of building the science base and continuing to evolve the conversation because there's so many uh, parameters to balance. I think this will be a good time to break for some questions before we move into some communications recommendations. So uh, if anyone has a question, feel free to raise your hand using the control panel or type in your question and my colleague Elliot will unmute your line and we can uh, open lines for some questions. We did have a question come in earlier during the presentation asking about a recording of the webinar as well as the availability of the slides. The recording, a link to the recording will be sent to everyone who has registered for the webinar sometime tomorrow. It will be sent to those who are on the line now as well as those who registered but did not attend. Um, as far as the slides, Trish, um, will, will the slides be made available in some way as well? Yeah, we can definitely send a link, figure out a way to send a link to the slides. Okay. On that follow-up email. And I don't see any other questions right now. Okay, well, we'll have another opportunity at the end, but I, I thought I'd move on to um, providing an overview of some resources that are available both from Midwest Dairy and from uh, the... Um, from DMI on resources related to the sustainable nutrition topic and the food waste topic because obviously the conversations are evolving and there are a number of uh, resources that we're continually updating so that you can track and review and continue to hold this conversation with your key audiences, whether it's your family or friends, your work colleagues, your customers, or your consumers. So the first uh, example here, the resource that I wanted to draw your attention to is our sustainability toolkit, which is on the MidwestDairy.com website. You can find it under the Dairy Resources tab, which is on the upper right-hand uh, um, corner of our website's homepage. And really, once you get into that toolkit, you'll see a full collection of sustainability-related resources. And our goal is really to give you a one-stop shop for easy-to-use communications messages, a PowerPoint deck, there's some uh, great blog content on both sustainable nutrition and the dairy community's commitment to sustainability. Uh, there's infographics and talking points, there's suggested social media content, and we're continually updating that for you so that you always have a one-stop shop for the most recent information on this topic. And we really encourage you to continue to stay up to date on the topic and to uh, share it in your own communications outreach, on your own personal social media challenge channels or in your own communications channels for your organization so that, again, we can continue to keep that conversation going. On the next slide, I wanted to preview a communications campaign that uh, Midwest Dairy will be rolling out in fall. Uh, Dr. Miller really talked about food waste and how that's really an important area that all of us can have a significant impact on. So we recently commissioned a consumer survey. We were looking at a variety of topics, but one area in particular um, addressed consumers' understanding of buy-by, use-by, and sell-by dates and how they really use this information not only to influence their purchase of milk and dairy foods, but how to decide when they might throw them away or determine they don't want to eat them anymore. So we're going to be looking at that information and developing a number of resources, whether it's website copy or infographics, uh, curriculum for use with uh, retail dietitians in a number of outlets throughout our area, focusing on how to offer some specific recommendations on how each of us can reduce our overall food waste, how we can maximize the use of our dairy products and really take advantage of dairy's versatility to turn our leftovers, say, into what we're calling planned over so that we can really maximize the ingredients and the products that are in our refrigerator. So this is, again, one area where we can all have impact. So I welcome you uh, to and encourage you to keep watching our website. We'll be sharing this with staff and our partners in the fall via our newsletters, via our social content, 
uh, via the communications that Midwest Dairy shares with our partners. So you'll be aware of when this information is available and how to access it, and we'll be providing some ec uh, recommendations on how you can share it with your key audiences. So that will be in the fall. Uh, I also wanted to draw your attention to another resource that I've mentioned on previous webinars. This is a really user-friendly resource from DMI called their Amplification Center. And um, you have either heard maybe mention of this or received email communications about this tool, but it is an online resource, a one-stop shop for you to go to get access to a variety of really strong dairy-related content that can easily be shared through your personal social media channels or through your organization's social media channels, primarily Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. So you simply just link your accounts to this tool. You review the content uh, at a cadence that works for you daily or weekly or how often you're able to do that. And then you can decide which content that you want to share. And you can share it with a one push of a button or you can tailor the content to personalize it to add some of your own feedback or input. So as you can see from some of the examples I've pulled out here, uh, sustainable nutrition, uh, sustainable food systems, uh, food waste, these are all topics that are regularly uh, included in the Amplification Center. And if this is something that you are interested in getting access to, you can respond to that follow-up email that uh, you receive from us. Um, and Elliot will share that with me, and I can make sure that you get access to that Amplification Center. I also want to point you to um, both the Midwest Dairy's website and DMI's website, so midwestdairy.com and dairygood.org. Again, both of these websites, we are consistently updating them with content, blog content, articles, infographics, social media recommendations. And so we, again, encourage you to continue to check out these resources on a regular basis because there's plenty of information there to keep you up to date on the latest science and the latest updates as we learn them real time. And we also encourage you to repackage the information in your own communications channels. All of these resources are designed for your use, so you are um, encouraged to share them in any way that works for you. And then next, for those of you who are in the health and wellness world, uh, you know very well that you also can have a strong impact to help reduce food loss and waste with those that you work with, whether it's uh, individuals, families, communities, businesses. And there's a new report available from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics called The State of America's Wasted Food. And that you can find on the Foundation's website at eatright.org. And this really highlights where wasted food can occur throughout the supply chain what are the environmental and economic impacts of wasted food, and where are areas that health professionals can really work with uh, their clients and their um, contacts to really provide some recommendations. And there's both a business and a consumer facing perspective. So I draw your attention to this resource uh, that you can review for background or that you can actually share with those who are looking for more information and recommendations. And last but not least, there's a couple of resources that have been put together in collaboration, the National Dairy Council and the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, both on the topic of sustainable nutrition. And they were both published in the August 2015 issue of the Journal of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So that's another resource you can check out. One article is on linking agriculture, nutrition, and health, and what's the role of the registered dietitian nutritionist. The second is uh, around the topic of plentiful, nutrient-dense food for the world. So great resources for health and wellness professionals um, that can really pr uh, bring to light those strong connections among agriculture, food, and health. The articles have responses to questions that are commonly asked about these topics so that you can really be armed with the knowledge and use these to educate your patients and clients. So again, check these resources out if you're interested. So maybe we can take one more quick break and see if there are any last straggling questions before we close. Um, yes, here's a question. What would be the timetable to get the schools to increase fat content in milk in the school lunch? Um, I, I can try to take that on, but um, you know, uh, 
that's a long kind of regulatory issue, and so it will it will take some time. Um, the issue of uh, the risk of saturated the relationship between the risk the intake of saturated fat and risk of cardiovascular disease is not settled science. Um, certainly, I, I would think that people fully and clearly understand that the consumption of of milk fat um, in this complex thing called dairy foods. Um, is neutral to a even positive in terms of its relationship to cardiovascular disease. That was that was stated in the dietary guidelines. Um, but until we can prove that there's a benefit to milk fat intake and or saturated fat intake, um, nutritionists will continue to recommend some kind of limit um, because it's not required in your diet. Um, not having it in your diet um, won't be a problem. It's nutrient. I'm, I'm sorry. It's uh, calorically dense, and so therefore we will continue to recommend low fat and fat free as a way to keep calories down. I'm not sure that that's a prudent recommendation because I think uh, we're learning that the people who have a certain amount of fat in their diet tend to have better satiety and therefore better regulation of, of calorie intake. Um, but until um, there's a change in the dietary guidelines, it's unlikely that there will be a change in school. So we're, we're probably years away from seeing that happen. Okay, another question. The new info on saturated fat has caused one of my friends who is a GMO detractor to ask, sure, research show, now shows GMO isn't safe, but how do we know it won't be turned around later, just like saturated fat? Um, that's a that's a, uh, a reasonable question, but um, again, the GMO um, issue is probably an individual basis. You have to look at each individual one and the research that's been done behind that individual um, genetically modified food. Um, they're all individually tested and examined for um, safety. Um, and they're thoroughly vetted before they're allowed in the marketplace. They're reviewed by the Food and Drug Administration, USDA, and other organizations as well. Um, they're pretty well vetted before they're allowed to even get into the marketplace. And so um, comparing something like that, a, a technology relative to a total diet and, and uh, a specific nutrient, I think they're, they're, you're comparing apples and oranges, so you, you can't necessarily compare the two. But each one is a case-by-case -case basis. So there may be GM products in the future that are probably that, that may not be good, but they won't make it into the marketplace because they will have to have the amount of science required and, and have it vetted through these agencies and others before they'll be, even be allowed into the marketplace. So the likelihood is, is very, very small. Okay, that's all the questions I show for now. Great. Thanks, Elliot. So as we close, I wanted to thank Dr. Greg Miller for sharing his insights this morning and thank all of you again for participating in this webinar. We encourage you to take what you learned today and join the conversation. Keep watching the resources we talked about and sharing this information about the important role that dairy plays in a sustainable food system. There's the affordability, the nutrition, uh, there's so many reasons to really talk about dairy in context of this conversation. And, and as you're continuing to talk with people and respond to questions, I want to remind you that both, both Midwest Dairy and the National Dairy Council are here to provide resources and assistance if you have any questions or need additional details. So feel free to reach out to us. We can certainly uh, get you information you need or direct you to another resource. And as a final follow-up, I just want to suggest that you watch your email over uh, the next few days. I believe it will be tomorrow. We're going to be sending out a follow-up with a link to the webinar. We'll figure out a way to get the slides to you. And if you're a registered dietitian nutritionist, there'll be information about how to log CEU credits. So all that information will be in a follow-up email along with a really brief survey because we'd love to hear your feedback on this webinar and any other topics you'd like us to add into the mix for the rest of the year. So thanks again for all of you for participating. Thanks to Dr. Miller. And uh, in closing, I hope you all have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Thanks so much.